Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to the uh, annual MasonicCon event here at Ezekiel Bates Lodge. So great to see all the brothers here in the row and all the guests. So welcome, everybody. It's an exciting day. Um, this is absolutely the highlight of my year. So I uh, really enjoy the opportunity to get up here and introduce our speakers. We've got a number of illustrious guests joining us today. Um, and the first of which I am going to introduce is Brother John Michael Greer. He is going to be speaking on Masonry and the Secret Societies. John Michael Greer was born in 1962, is an American author who writes on ecology, religion, philosophy, appropriate technology, oil depletion, and the occult. So it is quite a great variety of topics there. He served from December 2003 to December 2015 as the Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America and since then has headed the Druidical Order of the Golden Dawn, which he founded in 2013. He previously blogged at the Arch Druid Report on peak oil and related topics during 2006 to 2017, as well as the Well of, and I'm going to, Galabase. Galabase, thank you, on occultism 2014 to 2017 and is currently blogging at Ecosopia. He has written extensively on anthropological climate change and the societal collapse, which he believes will ensue as fossil fuel powered industries and societies decline. In, 2000, in a 2009 essay entitled Hagbard's Law, he contrasted the attention global warming receives compared to peak oil. And I quote, the global warming story, if you boil it down to its bones, is the kind of story our culture loves to tell, a narrative about human power. Look at us, it says, we are so mighty and we can destroy the world. The peak oil story, by contrast, is the kind of story we don't like. A story about natural limits that apply, yes, even to us. From the standpoint of peak oil, our self-anointed status as the evolution's fair-haired child starts looking like the delusion it arguably is. And it becomes hard to avoid the thought that we may have to settle for a rather less flattering role of just another species that overshot the carrying capacity of its environment and experienced the usual consequences. So. Um, you know, some happy thoughts here first thing on a <laughs> Saturday morning. I try to be serious. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, Brother Greer was entered, passed, and raised in Doric Lodge number 92 in Seattle, Washington in 2001 and is a member of the Scottish and York Rites. And with that, I would like to introduce Brother John Michael Greer. Thank you. We won't be talking about anything quite so grim this time. Okay. There we go. For the past 300 years or so, one of the most popular recreations among Masons and Collins alike has been attempting to trace the ancestry of the craft back to the esoteric traditions of the more or less distant past. Among many others, Knights Templar, Roman building collegia, Greek mystery cults, Celtic druids, Egyptian priesthoods, initiates of lost Atlantis and Lemuria, and even visitors from other planets have been pressed into service as, har as harbors in this quest. Such voyages are still ongoing, as I'm sure most of you know. In today's bookstores, shelves groan and cash, r cash registers ring incessantly, as book after book, tracing Freemasonry back to almost any source you care to imagine, spews forth from publishers into the eager and uncritical lap of the reading public. I once attended a lodge of research in Seattle in which every attendee was asked to bring a different cog theory about Masonic origins. Nobody had any trouble finding something unique. My favorite was from an author named Graham Hancock, who claimed that Freemasonry dates from long before 11,500 BC when it arrived on this planet with refugees from the planet Mars. As far as I know, Hancock isn't a Mason. And I have to say, if we have to rely on outsiders to provide us with crackpot origin theories for Masonry, something that we used to do very well all by ourselves, thank you, uh, our fraternity is falling down on the job. <coughs> now, if I had the brains the great architect of the universe gave a goose, I'd doubtless be out there doing likewise and raking in the proceeds in bushel baskets. There has got to be a discredited theory about Masonic origins somewhere that isn't being recycled by somebody in the current crop of writers though I have to admit I can't think of one. But today, at least, I propose to leave that lucrative project alone. Instead, I'd like to take a look along the other dimension of Masonry's relationship to the world of initiatic orders. Whether or not Masonry descends from ancient esoteric traditions, an astonishing number of esoteric traditions descend from Freemasonry. No, I'll go further than that. 
Just as Bertrand Russell famously described, the, famously remarked, the entire history of Western philosophy can be described as a series of footnotes to Plato. The, his the history of initiatic orders since about 1717 can equally well be described as a series of footnotes to Masonry. That may seem like an extreme claim. Two decades ago, I would have dismissed it out of hand, but the more research I've done, the more often I've turned up Masonic trowel marks in the most unlikely places. Take the common habit of having three degrees of initiation. That seems so obvious, but it doesn't appear anywhere until a few decades after Masonry itself evolved a three-degree structure. Older esoteric groups rarely have a degree structure at all, and those that do, there are usually two members of levels of membership, students and masters, not three. But Masonry established its third degree around 1720, and shortly after that, hey presto, three degrees start popping up all through Western esoteric groups, well, except for those that go for broke and start adding degrees with the reckless abandon uh, of, an era, of an esoteric French or an irregular French jurisdiction or something like that. The classic example of Masonic influence on occultism is the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which some of you may have heard of, the most famous occult order of the last three centuries. The Golden Dawn was founded in 1887 by three Freemasons, one of them William Wynne Westcott, who was a founding member of Quattro Coronati Lodge, and who had his fingers in just about every Masonic pie in Great Britain. It drew, the Golden Dawn drew much of its male membership from the esoterically inclined end of English masonry, its London temple meant in Mark Mason Hall, and the wands carried by the three main officers in a Golden Dawn temple are the same as those carried by the three main officers in English chapters of the Holy Royal Arch. Those of you who know your way around the Golden Dawn degree rituals already know that they ooze Masonic symbolism out of every pore. But the Masonic penetration of that particular current doesn't stop there, or doesn't start there, rather. The Golden Dawn drew heavily from the symbolism and ritual of the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, or SRIA, the British original of the Masonic Rosicrucian Society we have in this country. The SRIA was founded in 1868 by Robert Wentworth Little, another enthusiastic Mason, who at the time was an employee of the United Grand Lodge of England, and it admitted members only from among, among the ranks of Master Masons in good standing. Like the Golden Dawn after it, it drew quite a bit of its ritual and symbolism from Masonic sources. Now, the Golden Dawn also drew from the shadowy underworld of English 19th century magical lodges, organized by people such as Brother Kenneth Mackenzie and Brother Francis Irwin, most of which were, like them, organized by Freemasons and drew heavily on Freemasonry. So the Golden Dawn was partly derived from Freemasonry, and partly from the SRA, which was partly derived from Freemasonry, and partly from these other orders, which were partly derived from Freemasonry. As we go back to the sources of the SRIA, do we reach some authentic Rosicrucian current untainted by Freemasonry? Not a chance. The Rosicrucian material in the SRIA came from the Orden des Golden Rosenkreuz, or order, order of the Golden Rosy Cross, a German Rosicrucian order founded in the 1770s by, wait for it, a bunch of Freemasons. <coughs> now, the Golden Rosenkreuz had another claim to Masonic origins. They drew a lot of inspiration from the Rite of Strict Observance, which was a Masonic Templar body. To call the strict observance the inspiration of the Golden Rosenkreuzer was an isn't quite accurate. They were on opposite sides of one of the big political schisms that run through Masonic history with so much oppressive regularity. The strict observance, despite its name, was allied with liberal currents in German society. So a group of conservative Masons got decided they needed to fight fire with fire and organized a rite of their own. In Germany at that time, the only historical tradition with as much cachet of this as the Templars were the Rosicrucians. So the founders of the Golden Rosenkreuz came up with their own Masonic Rosicrucian order to counter the Masonic Templars of the strict observance and inevitably copied a lot of detail from the strict, obs from the strict observance along with the inevitable borrowings from, of course, masonry. <coughs> of course, this is not what the Golden Rosicrucians themselves said about their origins. No, no, no. They traced their roots back to 96 AD when an Egyptian priest called Ormus converted to Christianity and founded a secret society, rather unoriginally titled the Society of Ormus, and um, to pass on a Christianized version of ancient Egyptian wisdom. After a couple of centuries, the Society of Ormus uni united with another secret society organized by the Essenes to form the Order of the Rose Cross. In 1118, members of the Order initiated the Knights Templar. Three masters then went to Scotland, where they founded the Order of the Masons in the East, the original version of Freemasonry, but the order had, all, had previously arrived in Britain long before the 12th century and was established there in the time of King Arthur. <coughs> Does this sound familiar? If you've been reading recent speculative literature about the origins of Masonry, it certainly should. But I digress. <coughs> the label Rosicrucian itself opens a huge kettle of worms because the original Rosicrucian movement was a joke. 
I mean that quite literally. Um, it started out with a bunch of college students and professors with occult interests at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. In 1609 or thereabouts, they cooked this thing up as a satire. They wrote a tall tale about a mysterious adept named CRC who had founded an equally mysterious brotherhood that had all the answers to everything. And they got this thing, this announcement of this organization published as an appendix to a translation of this raucous Italian satire in which the god Apollo calls a convention of wise men to solve the problems of the world, listens to their harebrained schemes, and settles for price controls on cabbages, at which point everyone goes home rejoicing. The thing is, satire is risky business, especially at a time when everything everyone thought was settled for good is suddenly up in the air. The early 17th century was such a time, and once the satire saw print, people started to take it seriously. All of a sudden, people all over Europe wanted to find the Rosicrucians. Some wanted to join the order. Others wanted to locate its members and burn them at the stake. A second Rosicrucian manifesto surfaced, making nasty comments about the Pope and putting things in a much more serious political vein. It was probably written by different authors. Johann Valentin Andrea, who was part of the first group of merry pranksters, and spent most of his career as a very serious, stuffy Lutheran theologian, trying his best to distance himself from his college days, commented in his autobiography that the Rosicrucian comedy, as he put it, had a complete change of cast partway through. And before long, there were dozens of books in print claiming to pass on the secrets of the Rosicrucians, their spiritual practices, their magical and medical secrets, their organization and bylaws, and so on. Of course, that meant that people who wanted to be Rosicrucians and for some reason could not get in touch with the Rosicrucian order could simply found one of their own. That's what they did. That's where the Golden Rosenkreuz came from, among various others. And the Golden Rosenkreuz inspired the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, which proceeded to inspire the Hermetic Order, the Hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. And that's only the beginning, because the Golden Dawn itself became the inspiration for other magical lodges. That's the case with the Society of the Inner Light, the most the esoteric order founded by Violet Firth Evans, a.k.a. Dion Fortune, one of the most creative occultists of the 20th century. Now, you may be thinking, aha, Fortune is female, therefore any Masonic influence on her work must be via some secondhand channel. <laughs> You're forgetting about co-masonry, the irregular offshoot of French Grand Orient masonry that admits women to membership. The co-masons were hugely influential in spreading Masonic ideas and practices in the early 20th century. Ironically, they weren't even esoteric at the beginning. What, what happened, typically, is that um, a lodge under the Grand Orient of France decided to break with the landmarks and initiate a woman. Of course, they got their charter yanked instantly, but they shrugged and just kept on meeting and initiating more women. Before long, there were other lodges doing the same thing. They put together a grand lodge, and co-masonry was a going concern. Then the theosophist Annie Besant was entered past and raised and invited all her theosophical friends to petition. Um, so that's where co-masonry came from. Now, Dion Fortune's teacher, Dr. Theodore Moriarty, was a co-mason. Fortune's first initiation was into the three craft degrees of co-masonry. And when she founded the Society of the Inner Light, her three degrees of its, or the three degrees of its lesser mysteries were based on the co-masonic degrees. So she took the Golden Dawn material she'd received as a Golden Dawn initiate and some material from Theosophy and combined this with, you got it, more masonry. Now, of course, this isn't what the Dion Fortune claimed about her order. She claimed that it came straight from the mystic rituals of the Sun Temple of Ancient Atlantis. Sound familiar? See my previous comment about speculative literature. <laughs> so we have a lineage. From Freemasonry to the Golden Rosenkreuz, from there adding more Freemasonry to the SRIA, from there adding still more Masonry to the Golden Dawn, and from there adding co-Masonry to the Society of the Inner Light and its modern offshoots. Very straightforward. Just keep adding Masonry. That's more or less how you get to another important modern initiatic current. The story here starts with Brother Karl Kellner, who was an Austrian Freemason in the late 19th century, who belonged to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, which, as far as anyone knows, wasn't a, wasn't a Masonic offshoot. The HB of L, as it's usually called, blew sky high in a colorful scandal in the 1880s, and so Brother Kellner decided to set up a new quasi-Masonic rite to carry on the HB of L teachings. Kellner is his and his friend, Brother Theodore Royce, put together this new rite, the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, the Order of Templars in the East, and Royce contacted Brother John Yarker, at that time the world's leading purve purveyor of fringe Masonic charters, and got a charter for the Rite of Memphis and Mizraim to give the new system a plausible origin. While the OTO was still on the drawing boards in 1912, Royce gave a Memphis and Mizraim charter to Rudolf Steiner, who at that time was still secretary of the Theosophical Society in Germany and hadn't yet launched his own system of anthroposophy onto the market. 
A little later, Steiner taught his system to a Danish occultist named Karl Grafsoff, who then came to America, changed his name to Max Heindel, founded the Rosicrucian Fellowship in Ocean, uh, Oceanside, California. They're still there. A little later, after the OTO was a going concern, Royce uh, sold a charter to Brother Harvey Spencer Lewis, a New York City advertising executive turned occultist who wanted to be a Rosicrucian. Um, he, Lewis got the OTO charter and set up his, an organization of his own, the Ancient Mystical Order Rosicrucis, or AMORC. They're still around. Those were two of the four major players in the Great Rosicrucian Wars in the 1920s. Uh, the others were the Society of Rosicrucians, founded by <coughs> Brother George Winslow Plummer in 1916, and the Fraternitas Rosicruce, uh, Rosa, Rosicrucis, uh, which managed not to be founded by Masons at all. I'm not sure how. I'm, but the real impact of the OTO came by a, a different channel, Brother Alistair Crowley. I suspect many of you already know something about Crowley's long and, shall we say, sticky career. For those of you who don't, he started out as a Golden Dawn initiate, blew out of that scene, got recruited by Royce to head the British section of the OTO, a move Royce came to regret bitterly not very long afterwards, and proceeded to run it into the ground. Um, after he was safely dead, various groups popped up claiming the OTO inheritance, and plenty of other groups borrowed large ch chunks of these teachings without claiming a link. Now, since Crowley himself was a Freemason of an irregular jurisdiction, got his training from the Golden Dawn, then became of the OTO, these teachings inevitably came a, contained a lot of masonry, and yes, some of Crow Crowley's successors added even more masonry to the mix. Royce's OTO claimed a connection with the Knights Templar, though, and that opens up a much a vaster tangle, which I can only begin to uh, sketch out here. The starting point of all this was the famous oration of Chevalier Andrew Ramsay, Ramsay, a brother, I should say, Andrew Ramsay, in 1736, in which Ramsay first launched the claim that Freemasonry can trace its origins back to the knightly orders of the Crusades. He actually suggested the Knights Hospitallers of the order in question, but let's face it, the Hospitallers just don't have the kind of colorful reputation you need to make that kind of retrospective recruitment work. So the first great wave of Masonic higher degrees to bank off Ramsay's oration did the sensible thing and adopted the Knights Templar instead. <coughs> now, the Templars are a, a kettle of fish all their own. And there's been a fantastic amount of nonsense written about them si in the years since 1736. Before then, you won't find a whisper of any of that stuff for the simple reason that before 1736, nobody thought of the Templars as anything but a bunch of Catholic warrior monks who lost the Crusades and they got taken out on trumped-up charges. Nor is there any strong evidence from before 1736 that they were anything else. Despite what you may have read in speculative literature we were discussing, the Templar initiation rituals have survived. They've been translated and published by scholars. So has their rule, including the secret parts. And historians have all kinds of other evidence, including the complete inventory that, Philip the, that King Philip IV's goon squads made when they rounded up all the Templars in France. No, in case you're wondering, the mummified body of Jesus was not included in that inventory. <laughs> Just, you know, one of those things. Um, nor did much of anything else of interest. The Templars had a lot of money and property. They had a lot of booze. The phrase to drink like a Templar was in common use in, in most European languages at that time. And quite a bit of military hardware. And the French government had, if the French government had found any heretical books in the Templar chapter houses they seized, you could be sure they would have trumpeted that all across Europe. They didn't. But again, the Templars had a lot of money. They made good scapegoats for the final failure of the Crusades. And the French government under Philip IV had made quite a habit of accusing the king's political enemies of devil worship and using that as an excuse to terminate them with extreme prejudice. If you want an explanation for what happened to the Templars, there you go. Certainly that's the explanation everybody from the late Middle Ages to 735, 1735, <laughs> accepted as the facts in the matter. So what turned the Templars into the mass phenomenon they become today? What turned these devout and not particularly bright Catholic soldier monks into the fashionably diabolical sex magicians and global conspiracy mon mongers whose traces are being marketed so profitably to New Age audiences these days? It's an intriguing process, and it started ra with Ramsey's oration. Ramsey suggested that um, the Masons were descended from the comfortably upper-class knightly orders of the Crusades, rather than the depressingly working-class guys who built the cathedrals. This was very acceptable to the class-conscious French aristocrats who Ramsey wanted to attract into masonry. 1736 was also right in the first stages of the Romantic movements, and the Templars were romantic. They were very romantic. But the Templars were also a bit subversive. If you wanted to criticize the French monarchy and the Roman Catholic Church, and of course a lot of people in France wanted to do that by that time, um, the, tem the Templars made a great excuse. So these Templar rites proliferated, and so did other rites. 
So many other rights, I don't think anybody's ever managed to tabulate them all. From the 1750s to the end of the 19th century, the manufacture of new secret society rituals was a major growth in their history. The right of Memphis, the right of Mizraim, the right of Memphis and Mizraim, the Swedenborgian right, the right of Cagliostro, and so on. Some, the list goes on something in excess of 2,000 different degrees of initiation that we know of today. I'm not even going to try to sort out the relations between them. It's like trying to work out family trees at a mink farm. The important thing is that there was an inexhaustible fount of initiatory degrees flooding Europe at that time. And anybody who wanted to draw, nobody who wanted to draw on that fount for the purpose of setting up a secret society could possibly have gone away empty handed. <coughs> so that's one tangled web of affiliations and influences. For another, we're, go we're all going to put on white robes, grab golden sickles, and go pick some mistletoe at Stonehenge. Yes, it's time to talk about the Druids. <coughs> For all the publicity given to the Templar theory of, of Masonic origins these days, the most popular theory about the origins of Freemasonry in the 18th century was that it was descended straight from the ancient Druids. Let's see. Druids wear white robes. Masons wear white aprons. Druids have celebrations at the solstices. Masons have celebrations at the two St. John's days, which are close enough. Masons have blue lodges. Stonehenge has blue stones. Compared to the evidence for Freemasons from Mars, it's, posit it's positively ironclad. If that theory had not been elbowed out of the way in uh, out of the way in the 20th century by the Templar thing, Dan Brown's most famous book would probably have been titled The Merlin Code. Oh well. <coughs> so Freemasonry fed into the Druid revival, the reinvention of Druidry as a modern spiritual path in the 18th and 19th centuries. Most of the important Druid orders had direct connections to Freemasonry in one, in one way or the other. If you're ever going to look into those though, you need to know one th one essential point about Druid orders. How many of you ha saw the movie The Life of Brian by Monty Python? Okay, good. You remember the whole running gag about the Judean people's front, the people's front of Judea, the Judean popular front, and so on? The Druids were there first. The ancient order of Druids, the ancient archaeological order of Druids, and the ancient Druid order are three entirely unconnected organizations. The ancient order of Druids in America, which sounds like it ought to be an offshoot of the ancient order of Druids, was actually chartered by the ancient archaeological order of Druids, while the united ancient order of Druids, which sounds like it should be related, actually divided from the ancient order of Druids. Got that? There will be a, qui there will be a quiz at the end of the lecture. But I digress. <coughs> Some Druid groups seem to have gotten everything they had through the Druid revival directly. Other Druid groups link back to lines of descent we've already traced. The ancient and archaeological order of Druids, for example, was founded b in, brother in 1874 by the same brother Richard Wentworth Little, Robert Wentworth Little, try that again, who founded the SRIA six years earlier, and it was very Masonic. It had an American branch, the Ancient Order of Druids in America, or AODA, which was founded in 1912 by Brother James, Manch James Manchester of Boston. Its third Grand Arch Druid, um, who wrote most of our current most of the current ritual work was Juliet Ashley, who was initiated into, into an irregular Masonic rite, and well, at seventh Grand Arch Druid with me. Um, so yes, it's got a bit of Masonic influence in it. There's a funny story out of the history of that order that points up just how pervasive the Masonic connection is in these traditions. During the second half of the 20th century, the old-fashioned orders like AODA were very unfashionable. I mean, they kept their clothes on during ritual. Well, you know, how, what could be more boring? So orders of that kind ended up sharing a lot of members. AODA ended up more or less partnered with an Essene order, a Gnostic church, an offshoot of the Golden Dawn, and an order of spiritual alchemy that claimed descent from, yes, of course, the Knights Templar. So Sunday was a Gnostic church service, Tuesday the Druids met, Wednesday the Golden Dawn, Thursday there's a class on spiritual alchemy, and then the Essenes celebrated the Sabbath on, on Friday night, and it's all of the same people. What made it work was that every one of those orders was an offshoot of masonry in one way or the other, so that everyone knew what to do when the presiding panjanda rapped three times. That kind of thing was very common back in the day. But we can follow another chain from masonry out to something very different, starting with the Elu Koyan. That was a lodge founded in 1767 by a very strange man, Brother Martinez de Pasquale, who showed up in southern France with a charter allegedly signed by Bonnie Prince Charlie, and started founding lodges on the fringes of Freemasonry. One of his initiates was Brother Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, a mystic who wrote a series of very, very abstruse books about spirituality. Saint-Martin, even though he was a Mason and got his training from Pasquale in a very formal lodge setting, ended up ditching formal ritual in favor of the mysticism derived from the, the teachings of the German shoemaker mystic Jacob Böhm. This did not stop Brother Gerard and Kaus, the great French occultist usually known by his pen name Papou, from turning him into the patron saint of a new initiatic group, the Martinist Order, which Papou founded in 1886. Martinism drew from the Eloquen and from the high grades of French masonry. Um, in fact, drew from is a little um, bit 
gentle. Uh, Papu plagiarized the first Martinist degree from one of the degrees of the Egyptian rod Cagliostro and the third from the Beneficent Knights of the Holy City, another Masonic order. Um, the Martinist order broke up in 1916 when Papu died, but there are various orders claiming its mantle nowadays. But the fusion of the Elucoin and French high-grade masonry went in strange directions. In 1887, as the Golden Dawn was getting going, a group, a group of French occultists in Paris founded Lord Kabbalistique de la Rose Croix, the Kabbalistic Order of the Rose Cross. One of its members, the occult novelist and art critic jo Josephine Peladan, split off a few later, years later and founded his own order, the Ordre Catholique de la Rose Croix, or Catholic Order of the Rose Cross. Peladan's order wasn't a great success, and when he died, his secretary, um, a small-time occultist named Georges Monti, had, had even less luck with it. But in his last years, Monti befriended a young man named Pierre Plantard, who had a future ahead of him. <coughs> Plantard spent much of his life living with his mom and earning a little money as a maintenance man for a Catholic church in Paris. He had a real talent for plausible nonsense, though, and he plunged into the underworld of French occult secret societies with a great goodwill. He studied Peladan's stuff with Monti. He studied with Amork. He tried to float a series of grandiosely titled secret societies during the war years and got in trouble with the Nazi government for, for uh, doing that, even though he was probably further to the right than they were. After the war, he decided his moment had come and he founded his great secret society, the Priory of Sion. If you've read the Da Vinci Code or the allegedly non-fiction books on which it's based, you know all about the Prior of Zion, right? It's the most powerful secret society of all, tracing, a, a preserving a bloodline descending through the Cathars, the Templars, and the Merovingian kings of Dark Age France from the, king, the children of Jesus of Nazareth by Mary Magdalene, right? Wrong. The Priory was founded by Pierre Plantard in 1956. In its first years, it functioned mostly as a minor protest group trying to get expanded access to low-income housing. It never had more than a handful of members at any one time, and most of its for most of its history, its effective membership consisted of Pierre Plantard. He wasn't very good at recruitment, but he was a genius when it came to publicity. He invented a bogus history of the order, going all the way back to the Merovingians, hired a writer of pop esoteric potboilers named Gerard de Sede to publicize that, got a friend to forge a bunch of documents backing up the story. And this is where you see the man's true genius, okay? Libraries with rare old documents are usually really, really careful about keeping anyone from taking documents out. But very few people have thought about trying to keep people from bringing documents in. So Plantard had, had, has, had his friend cook up these forged documents, and then Plantard walked into three or four big, important French research libraries and stuck these documents into the files, <laughs> and then went back a few months later, look what I just found in the Bibliothèque Nationale. It was a brilliant move. <laughs> so that's where, you know, all the stuff you've read about hidden Templar papers at Ron Le Chateau, secrets concealed in Nicolas Poisson's paintings, all that, that's all Plantard's invention. The Jesus claims were not his idea. Those, were, those came from the, the trio of English documentary filmmakers who picked up Plantard's claims, turned them into the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and splashed them all over the place, providing Dan Brown with a good deal of the raw material. I could cite other examples of the same process, starting with Freemasonry and ending up almost anywhere you care to name, but I'll, I'll content myself with just one more. That is the Rosicrucian Order of the Crotona Fellowship, or ROCF, which was founded in England right after the First World War. It's Magi Supremus, and yes, that's ungrammatic, as ungrammatical as it sounds, was a man named George Alexander Sullivan, a music hall actor turned secret master of the universe, who went by the moniker The Master Aureolis. <coughs> Sullivan was cut from the same cloth as Pierre Plantard. He knew how to think big. He informed his followers, yes, he had someone like Plantard. He was none other than the immortal Comte de Saint-Germain. Okay. Um, as Christian Rosencruz, he'd founded the Rosicrucians. As Francis Bacon, he wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. Now here he was again in a watch out world. <coughs> he had a couple of elderly ladies with money who funded him and enabled him to put on some of his grand projects, put some of his grand projects into operation. He had a correspondence course with students in England and America. He had a school, the Academia Rosicrucis. He had his own theater company, the Theatricum, which existed for the sole purpose of putting on his plays. He was Shakespeare, right? So of course there were new plays. By all accounts, they were incredibly bad. Unfortunately, his plans foundered on one relatively minor point. If you claim to be immortal, you need to leave up, live up to that by not dying. The Master Aureolus didn't quite manage that and dropped dead in 1942, whereupon the whole ROCF quietly dissolved. 
Despite that, it ended up having a serious impact on the world's religious history because his order had a member named Dorothy Clutterbuck who had a student named Gerald Gardner. Yes, that Gerald Gardner, the founder of Wicca, who also studied with Aleister Crowley and was a member of the ancient Druid order, among other things connected one way or another with masonry. There's a good reason, in other words, by why Gardnerian Wicca has three degrees of initiation, why candidates for the first are brought to the meeting place bound and hoodwinked and so on, although they're divested of a lot more than metallic substances beforehand. I think Gardner truly believed he'd found an archaic tradition dating back to the beginning of time. So many of the occult systems he'd encountered had so much in common, it must have been easy to assume they all represented survivals and reformulations of some original tradition. And of course he was right. The one hitch is that the original tradition was Freemasonry. That's only a hitch, though, if you start with the assumption that the, origi the original wisdom has to be a historical phenomenon. Plato warns us of the folly of such an assumption. No matter how old or how well authenticated it might be, no drawing of a circle is actually the circle, the archetypal circle in the heavens. If you found the very first circle anyone ever drew scratched on the wall of a cave somewhere, you might be surprised by how rough and uneven it is. In the same way, I suggest, what's essential about Freemasonry isn't so much that it's the origin of so many elements of the Western esoteric tradition, though that's worth noting. It makes a good reason for modern esotericists who are qualified for membership to consider petitioning their local Masonic lodge. What's essential about Freemasonry is that it embodies in its own rather idiosyncratic way something timeless and transcendent, something we talk about in our ritual as the lodge not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that lodge is present, imperfectly to be sure, but present, even in the most prosaic meeting of the most ordinary Freemasons Lodge on the planet, for those who have eyes to see. Thank you.